All right, welcome to week 10. We are definitely getting closer to the end of the term. Four weeks left after this one. Um, today we're going to talk about backup and restore. It's the absolutely most riveting topic ever. If you didn't notice it, it was being sarcastic. Um, nobody finds backups fun. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, technically what a backup is, although you guys should know what those are by now. Uh, the kinds of backups, the different strategies and things that are specific to MySQL slash MariaDB. And then I'll do the same thing uh, talking about restores. All right, so backup. A backup's a procedure for making SR copies of data for the purpose of restoration in case of loss or damage. Dog eats your laptop. Hopefully your stuff is backed up. There's a good chance the hard drive survives, but just saying. Um, data center burns to the ground. Hopefully you have a backup somewhere else. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Just make sure you got copies of all your stuff somewhere other than the one place it's always stored. So there's three kinds of backups. Most people think about a backup and all they think about is I take my files, I copy them somewhere else and they're backed up, which is fine for individual users, for home users, um, sometimes even for small companies. Do you have products like my, my OneDrive from Microsoft that actually, if you're running as a Microsoft 365 tenant, actually allows versioning so that as you save your files into OneDrive, it keeps old copies. And even if you delete it, you can restore it from its trash bin. So, you know, but for enterprise, backups tend to be a little um, chunkier, like me, a little rounder, a little more to it than just, you know, um, your typical backup my one terabyte hard drive time assist situation. So there's three kinds of backup. There's a full backup which is a complete copy of a partition. Another, we're gonna use the word partition because basically it's everything on that disk. In Windows, it'd be a drive letter. Mac users, it's the disk. Um, you have incremental backups, which is a backup of only the files that have changed since the last full backup. And then we have a differential backup. It's an archive of only the files I've changed since the last backup. So here's an example. We do a full backup and we do it seven days a week. And the file system happens to be two terabytes of data. So on Sunday, we back up two terabytes. On Monday, we back up two terabytes. On Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, two terabytes. So at the end of the week, two times seven is how many terabytes? 14 terabytes. That's a lot of room, right? Seven days a week, two terabytes a day, 14 terabytes a week. Um, Seven hundred twenty-eight terabytes a year. That's assuming your data doesn't grow, that it just stays the same. So full backups are good because it's the entire thing. They're bad because they take up a lot of room, right? Even if you're backing up to a cloud service like Amazon, for example, unless you're using their super slow storage options, like what they call Glacier, and it's called Glacier because it's slow like it's frozen. No, literally, that's why it's called Glacier. It's going to cost you a fair amount of money. Um, if I remember right, Amazon charges something like $52 a terabyte for fast, fast file storage. Uh, if you're using something like an S3 bucket, um, it probably costs it's something like uh, $10 a terabyte, something like that. But you're paying for traffic in and out also. So you're paying for the network traffic and the storage. Cool to have a full backup because you can just grab the whole thing and bring it back. It's bad because it's costing you money. 
And the other thing that's bad about it is, how many of you have tried uploading two terabytes over the internet? How long do you think that takes? Depending on your internet connection, it's gonna take a while. Like I've got a three gigabit fiber connection that's literally three gigabit down, three gigabit up. Backing up two terabytes of data still takes over half an hour. And most businesses are not running three gigabit fiber connections. They're running something like anywhere between 100 megabit to 500 megabit, roughly, most businesses, because it's all they need. That's another shock is business internet's really expensive compared to home internet. Because there's certain standards that they have to uphold compared to home internet. How many people here are with Rogers? How good has Rogers been to you? Well, you're lucky because in my neighborhood, it's been three years of anybody who's on Rogers randomly does not have internet for days on end. A bird takes a poop and somebody's internet disappears. No, really, I'm not kidding. It's that bad. Well, that's why Bell's making a killing in my neighborhood, switching to fiber. Um, so internet is expensive for businesses. So what we tend to want to do instead is either an incremental or a differential. So an incremental, on day one, you do a full backup. So you back up the whole thing, the whole two terabytes. Then you back up only what's changed since that day. So on Monday, we generate another gigabyte of files. So on Monday, we back up one gigabyte. On Tuesday, there's another 200 megabytes of file that were created. So the backup on Tuesday would be 1.2 gigabytes because there's 1.2 gigabytes of changes since Sunday. Wednesday would be 1.6 because somebody created another 300 megabytes of files. Therefore, it's 1.6 since Sunday. The backup grows through the week. Cool. Until you get to Saturday, and then your backup is 2.8 gigabytes. It's not that big, but it's still, you know, half of a DVD. Just, just so you can think about, you know, half of a movie. Not Blu-ray. Just, you know, the old DVDs. So it's significantly more efficient because you're not moving two terabytes every time. You're moving two terabytes once, and then you're making incrementals. Uh, for a lot of companies, this is the way they prefer, because if they need to do a restore from a backup, they pull the two terabytes down, then they grab the differences. It makes restores almost as fast as if you were pulling full backups all the time. Then we have the differentials. Differentials, also known as a delta, for those that want the technical term, means it's the difference since the previous backup. Not since the previous full backup, it's since the last backup. So Sunday, we back up two terabytes. On Monday, we generate one, one gigabyte of data. On Tuesday, we generated 200 megabytes. So on day one, we back up one gig. Day two, we back up 200 megabytes. Day four, we back up 400 megabytes. 300 megabytes, 400 megabytes, 500 megabytes. So each one is only the files that have changed since the previous day. Makes backups really fast because it only backs up what has changed. Cool. If speed and storage space is a concern, which for large corporations it can be, um, Actually, even for small corporations, they care too because they don't have as much money for storage. So everybody cares about space and speed. The differential is the best one bang for the buck for backing up your stuff. Can anybody think about what the problem might be, though, with the differential? Yes. So let's just say everything is working fine and Thursday night at 3 a.m., Server commit decides its hard drives no longer exist and the drives die. Luckily, you have spare drives in your hardware cabinet. Pop new drives in the server, reboot it. Let's do a restore. First, we restore the two terabytes. But unlike the full or the incremental, we have to pull 
Monday, then Tuesday, then Wednesday, then Thursday. We have to bring it back step by step so the restore can take a lot longer. So that's, you know, if with everything you do with computing, it's always a balancing act between what is the absolute best possible way of doing something and the most affordable way of doing something. And you have to decide, you pick your poison. You either bite the bullet and pay lots for storage and internet traffic, assuming you're backing off site, or you're going to go with, oh, I want to go somewhere in between, or I literally need to save money and time, which is the last one. Um, A lot of companies will choose to do the differential just because they don't want to pay tons of money. So, man, I'm going to age myself. I remember when I started first started working in Ottawa, I had to go into the server room every Friday morning to change the tapes in the backup machine. Right? So tapes only held so much stuff. Every Friday, I had to go into and hit the button, write the number, the date on the tape, put the tape in a box, grab the new tape, put it in, so that the next batch of backups would still have room on the tapes. And then what would happen is on Monday morning, I don't know why there was a three-day gap, somebody would come and grab the box of tapes and take them off-site to one of our other locations so that if that building burned down, we had backups somewhere else. We did differentials. Because we were backing up the physical media, let me tell you, restores took a long time. Because we actually had to go to the other location, grab the, find the tape, bring it back, put it in, and find whatever we're trying to restore. Um, same thing with trying to restore files. Restoring files from a full backup is much easier than from a differential because you have to first find the full backup and then walk through each of the differentials until you find the change you need. Because we all know, as we work on stuff, the same file could change five times a day, all week. And if we need to find that spot where somebody, you know, screwed up, you literally have to walk through all the backups until you find the one you need. So those are the three types of backups you'll get. So a bit of strategy. Excuse me. So ideally, we'd like to back everything up all the time, and keep it around forever and ever and ever. Operations are notorious for being um, hoarders for data. They don't like to give up data. Realistically, it's not something that we can do. Uh, back in the day when we were using back tape backups, tapes were expensive. Looking back, they were cheap, now that I know more about this kind of stuff. But each tape was $20 a tape. For someone who's earning $20 an hour, that $20 tape was really expensive, right? But now I'm looking at them going, whatever. But take that tape and now you need 100 tapes. The number grows. You're only going to keep those for so long, so you recycle your tapes. So after you've had so many months of backups, you grab the old box, bring it back, wipe all the labels, put them in as these tapes are safe to use. If you're backing up to Amazon or to Azure or to Rackspace or whatever cloud computing service you decide to use for your backups, you're paying for that storage space. They don't give you storage space for free. Nobody gives you storage space for free. Therefore, even then, you want to limit how long you back things up because you're paying for room and you may never need that stuff. So you need a combination of short-term and long-term strategies. So you should always have three copies of the data, one of which is off-site. So normally you'd have the live server, you have a local backup on another machine, hopefully in another room, and then you also do a backup somewhere else. So uh, the company I was at before we got our Amazon infrastructure, this is going to sound, every time I say the story, it sounds so stupid. We literally backed up to one of the partner's houses. We had a server running in his basement 
with lots of hard drives in it, and we did our off-site backups to this guy's house. It was off-site. Notwithstanding the fact that his house was only a three-minute drive from the office, so if it was a natural disaster, probably his house would be taken with it, so it wasn't the best plan. But, you know, it was better than if the office burned down. The odds are his house, you know, four or five blocks away would probably not burn down. Uh, unless you're in Alberta, where the world is always burning. Um, you know, so you've got that kind of setup. So you should always have one off-site production server and a backup, hopefully in another room. So once we got our Amazon infrastructure, what we ended up doing was we had the server room. We also had a locked server cabinet at the back of our storage slash warehouse space. So it was like mounted up high on a wall. We had a server sitting there with all it was was disks. And it was the backups were backed up to that server so that if the server room got destroyed, we had on-site backups for a quick restore. And then we were backing up to Amazon. So that, you know, so two backups every time, both locations. Um, ideally, if you're lucky, you can have what they call a hot backup, which is one server cloning itself to another server. So if one server dies, you pull the plug and you just switch to the other server and the other server comes back. In the database world, that's called replication. And then you have cold backup for insurance, also known as disaster recovery. In other words, a backup on Amazon, a backup in somebody's basement, something, as long as it's not in the building. So if the building is goes to the ground, you still have all your important data. You should always test a restore process at multiple levels. As a rule of thumb, your backup process should be, your restore process should be tested once a month. I can guarantee nobody does that. Almost no, no, that's not true. Banks do it. Banks actually test daily. They have like automated testing for their backups. Um, can you imagine if CIBC suddenly lost all their, their money information? They're really serious about their backups, you know, or BMO or Bank of Nova Scotia, whatever. Um, so you should always test a restore process, multiple levels, going from a complete restore to trying to find a file. There might be some other items you want to do, but that covers most of it. Okay, so database specific backup and recovery. Now we're actually gonna to get to what's applicable more to you guys for this course. Up till now, it was just general backup concepts. Uh, important database administration support tasks include backups, offline and online. So offline is known as a cold backup. An online backup is known as a hot backup. Um, recovering stuff like uh, table spaces. Um, recovery can be used for many things, especially for database. You can restore all your tables. You could use it to build test and development environments. So for example, you have a development group, you have a team that writes software, talks to the database server. Are you going to let them develop against the production server where people are actually using all the time? The answer is no. Normally you'll have a dev slash test environment where they can develop against safely without damaging production server. Um, or Maybe the restore happens directly to their machine so they can develop completely self-contained on their machines. Um, you can also use it to recover missing or in erroneous data in tables. Um, guilty of that one. Um, had to, so what I mean by recovering erroneous data, here's an example. Uh, one day at 6 a.m. I was working because I worked early and I, coffee had not kicked in yet. And I typed in truncate table name. It was the wrong. I truncated configuration data for our products. And I'm like, oh my God, this particular set of tables hadn't gone live yet. As in, we hadn't started shipping products to the customers that use those tables yet. So of course I do the email of shame saying, I just screwed up, um, give me 15, 20 minutes. Nobody tried to change anything. 
won't touch this. Went to the backups, restored it from a local backup, grabbed those the records for that table, dumped them using a backup routine, and inserted them into the tables and brought it all back. It took me 20 minutes because I had a hot backup, literally. I don't know, hot backup. I had a cold online backup, as in I had a full copy of the database from the previous day. Sitting on another server somewhere, it's not up to date, but it's up to date enough that it didn't wasn't the end of the world. Uh, so that's what I mean by recovering missing or erroneous data in tables. If you have someone that's not paying attention and they literally type in truncate on a production server because the coffee has not kicked in yet, that's what you want response for. And I will admit I did it at least once, maybe more than once in over 20 something years. All right, so backup strategies continued. Cold backups, those are the easiest ones to do. It's good enough for database contents that don't change very much. Or users can tolerate downtime. So for servers that don't change very often, that's in, you know, a handful of changes an hour, where theoretically you can live if you lose some of that data. Or if the server goes offline temporarily, because when you're doing a backup, you have to lock the tables so that changes can't happen anymore. So therefore you want to have a snapshot and you need to lock access so nobody can use it while the backup is happening. And then you back up the files. They're easy peasy to do. You use a scheduled job. On Linux, it's a cron job. On Mac, it's I don't know what it is. On Windows, uh, there's an actual scheduler that you can use. That you can get it to do jobs automatically. And you literally type in the database backup command. And it dumps it to a file, and then you back up that file. The good news is, is that you can compress the files, make them small. You, know, you back it up. A database backup file is basically a big blob of text. What's the thing that's, that compresses the best? Text. Therefore, you can take a, you know, 10 gigabyte backup, and it'll probably be half, half a gig, 500 megs for a 10 gig backup. It's cool. It's usually good enough for a lot of things. Hot backups. Those are harder to do. Um, it's for mission critical databases. And essentially, the way a hot backup works is it uses a, um, I just remember the no, the modern terminology that dropped some of the phrasing that's considered it not correct anymore. Um, so you have a master database, and you have a bunch of nodes that are um, replicas. Let's go with the word replicas as opposed to the politically incorrect term that we're not supposed to use anymore. So what happens is every single time something gets written to the master a copy is sent to each of the replicas. So you do an insert into this table. The, the database server actually knows an insert happened and it will send it to each of the nodes. So each of the nodes are always up to date. So that's a, known as a um, single master multiple target style uh, clustered environment. It is the second easiest one to set up. Most database software has tools built into it that you literally say, oh, this is gonna be a replication target. Click, click, click. Um, you can have what they call a multi-master setup where you connect to the database, you run a select statement, it grabs the next available database. You do a write statement and it sends the insert statement to all the databases at the same time. So they're all kept up to date all the time. The good thing about one of those kinds of environments is you can do a cold backup at any time you want. Because you can do the cold backup from what is not the master node. You can do a backup from any of the replication nodes and nobody's gonna notice because the server is just doing whatever it wants to do because everybody else is being served up anyways. Um, there's started to be even more advanced versions of this with cloud computing. Um, Microsoft and 
Azure, and I'm sure Oracle does the same thing. Um, in their cloud offerings, they now have uh, multi-node or multi-region setups. So what you do is you set up your server and you say, oh, by the way, this particular server is available in US East 1, which is North Carolina, uh, Canada 1, which is Montreal, US West, whatever, which is in Seattle, and uh, Europe 2, which is in Germany. Okay, so you can say, this database exists in all these places at the same time. Good, done, you're done setting it up. It actually takes care of all the replication, all that hard stuff for you. You pay for it because you not only you pay for, even though you're saying it's only one database server with one address. So no matter where you are in the enterprise, you use the same address and it figures out the closest version to you and uses that as your source. They charge you each for each node full price. So let's just say your database server costs $110 a month. For a business, that's not very much, but let's go $110 a month. And you have five locations, you're paying $550 a month. But you never need to think about your server shitting the bed. You know, insurance. So clustered environments are the best, but also the hardest to manage. If you can use a cloud-based solution that does the clustering for you, and you can afford it, fantastic. Absolutely go for it. It'll make your life and your business's life so much better. Um, if it's a small company, and not a lot of stuff happens through the day, do some cold backups, maybe do four cold backups a day. Um, I mean, at my old job, our main database was sitting at about seven and a half gigabytes. And uh, I think the backup took 45 seconds. Like, you know, you just time it at 6 a.m. at noon when everybody's at lunch, six o'clock at night and then at midnight, four backups a day. And at worst, you're losing six hours of data. Which wasn't a really good solution, but, you know, that's what they went for because they didn't want to pay for a multi-node setup. So, you know, those are different kinds of backups. Okay, so where do you store all these backups? You keep a copy on the server itself. Well, assuming you're running actual servers in your server room and not on a cloud service. You want to make a backup and keep a copy on the server itself because it'll be the absolute fastest way to restore. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It'll be the fastest way to restore it. You do want to put it on a separate disk. Right? So imagine like your laptops. You have how many hard drives in your laptop? Most of you here, I'll say, has one. The HPs, the ones that have cheap HPs probably have two. Uh, because HP is notorious for putting in a fast drive, a really small fast drive, then a really slow big drive. Because they like using up their old stock of equipment. And so if you only have one hard drive and you're backing up the files to your one hard drive, and your hard drive dies, your file's gone. The server's the same idea. If you back up to the main, same partition, same disk as your main operating system, where the database is running, and that disk dies, you lost your local backup. So always back up to another disk. You should be copied to another server, either on-site or off-site, or cloud storage. Make sure you encrypt your data if you're sending it to cloud storage. Um, that's an advanced topic right there. That's actually cloud-specific. But yes, if you're going to back up to a cloud storage, you probably want to send it to an encrypted data store. Um, Potentially, you want to back it up to tape or some other hard drive that you can take off-site. Um, you want to have multiple locations. So back up to the local machine, back up to the cloud, back up to another machine. Just always have multiple locations. Otherwise, if one of them dies, that's your only backup. You may as well not even have had a backup. Okay. <laughs> no, not at all. But you're right on schedule, like every week. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about specifically backing up MySQL, and most of this applies to MariaDB. So, yeah.
So what should you back up when you back up a MySQL server? Uh, number one, the database contents, right? So you want to dump the entire database for a full backup. Um, and, you know, you probably want to send it as a physical backup. Uh, log files, if you are using um, MySQL's binary log, so you can do incremental backups. Um, not something most people do. I'll admit it right now. MySQL makes it really painful to do incremental backups because it's MySQL and MariaDB. And actually, to tell the truth, they're pretty much all painful. The other thing about it, Postgres is worse. Uh, and it's a better product and it's worse. Um, so log files are cool. Um, you can do recover for incremental backup. You can do point in time recovery. So if you are doing backups of the binary log every half hour or whatever, in theory, you could go back and recover from half an hour from whenever anything fails. There's a lot more planning involved in that, but you know, there's that. Um, you probably want to back up uh, configuration information, such as your, in this case, it's my CNF, um, depending on if it's MariaDB, my, MySQL, is it running on Mac, running on Linux, running on Windows, this file is going to be a different spot, it might even be called something different. But the my.cnf is basically the configuration file for your server that says, these are the ports that are allowed to connect, these are the IP addresses, this is the network card we're listening on. Uh, these are the features we have turned on and off. Uh, you know, this is the size of the memory buffers, the much, much RAM allocated, that kind of stuff. It's all in this file. Uh, if you have any cron jobs that run nightly to back up your database, probably want to back those up too so you don't have to recraft them from scratch. Um, so for the config files, you probably want to use a source control system. So, um, you know, BZR stands for bizarre. Almost nobody uses it anymore, but it's around. Uh, Git, I'm sure you've heard of Git by now. Uh, probably most heard of its most public version, which is GitHub. Um, SVN, which stands for subversion. Personally, I really like subversion, but almost nobody offers it as a service. So I run my own. <laughs> um, so the, one of the perks of having using a source control system that's not on the server for your config files is A, they're backed up somewhere else. B, you can check in your changes as you go so that if you realize you suddenly screwed up the config file, you can just go look back and you know do, do a, grab the old versions until you find one that works, just like you would with programming. So version control will save your bacon. All right, so MySQL, and this also applies to MariaDB, most, more or less. Um, the binary log. So MySQL does something called uh, a write-ahead log. Um, Postgres has this too, and I'm assuming Oracle has it, and all the other guys have something similar. When you tell MySQL to do something to the database, so insert, update, delete, truncate, create, alter, drop, you know, anything that modifies the contents of the database in any way, shape, or form, the command gets added to the binary log before it even tries to do it. So basically it says, oh, I'm going to go update account ID number one and set the balance to zero, and you run it. What it does is it doesn't actually do that right away. It takes that command and adds it to the binary log. Then it executes it. Then if it succeeds, it updates the binary log saying, hey, this command actually worked. And after a while, all these commands get, you know, they just keep accumulating and the blogs roll over and roll over so that you literally have the ability to play back command by command what happened to your database. By default, MySQL does not have this turned on, just so you know. There's a few reasons why it's not turned on. One, it increases I.O. operations, because if you're writing the command to a file, that means it's got to write something to the disk, do it, and then update the command on the disk, and move on. So you're, you're literally tripling the amount of I.O. operations every single time you try to do anything. Um, two, 
a lot of people, when they actually do do it, don't do it properly. And they store the binary log file in the same place as the database itself. The problem is that in most enterprise environments, databases don't run on fast disks. Like most people don't think about it. Most enterprise servers are still using physical spin disks in a RAID array. The RAID array will be faster than an individual disk, but they're still spin disks. They're slow. So if you are constantly writing to the binary log and it's on the spin disk, everything's gonna get slow. So normally what you wanna have, is you wanna have a very fast drive of some sort, an SSD, an NVMe drive, you know, basically solid state drive, just for the binary log. But this drive will be written to a lot. And what happens if you write to a solid state drive too much? It dies. So you need redundant. <laughs> Let's see how this gets complicated, right? Where if you want to use this feature, you have to plan for it. You just don't turn it on and go YOLO. You actually have to know the impact of what you're doing. So the binary log is cool. It keeps track of all the commands that were run, but you have to plan for it. You just don't turn it on and assume everything is going to be good. It's you can use a command called MySQL bin log, and it's literally MySQL bin log from MySQL, and it's Maria bin log from MariaDB. But MariaDB is really nice for you, and they actually create an alias for then call it MySQL bin log because they have to be compatible with MySQL. And you can use that to decipher the contents of the log. The file is in binary. You cannot see the contents of it. And literally, whatever you give file name, it'll go .001.002.003 as it grows. The binary log is transaction compatible. It knows you started a transaction. We'll be talking about those, I think, next week. And there's actually a log index that keeps track of all the log files that were created. Now, before I get off this point, there's dangers to using the binary log. Because if you use the MySQL bin log and you run it on a, on a file, it'll output the commands that were run. Which means if somebody, if you're running this feature and somebody compromises your server, they can get all the commands that were run against your server. So they basically get real time content. And this data is not encrypted. It's just sitting there on a disk for anybody to take. So remember last week's conversation about security? Be extra safe if you're using the binary log because they can literally say, hey, these are all the commands that were run today. We can actually, based on how the commands are run, you can actually figure out how an application is written. Those that really do know what they're doing. So, you know. All right. So, for backups in MySQL, the command is MySQL dump. You dump the database. You take the contents and you pour it out into a file. Literally dump it into a file. Um, in this case, the commands are written on screen as if we're running it from a Linux command prompt. Uh, I'll actually once I'm done, I'll show you guys a couple of demos about the backups. Um, you can dump individual tables. You can dump the whole database. Um, the default output from MySQL dump is literally a series of SQL statements that is create tables and insert statements. The file is plain text. You do a backup, you can just read the entire contents of the database. See previous statement about security. Make sure your backups are safe because they get a copy of everything and they don't even have to try. Um, you can actually, at least on Linux, and God forbid I'm going to say this, for Mac users, it's a little, you can do it on Windows, it's a little harder. You can actually take the backup and pipe it, feed it into another command and actually do a backup and restore at the same time. So you can actually clone one server to another server in one step with one command. Um, not always the best way to do it, but you can. Uh, MySQL dump has a couple of parameters you can feed it. Um, single transaction is important, especially if it's a MySQL database that actually supports transactions. 
Um, it means that it's going to dump the entire database as a single command. Normally it does one command per table. And that means that if the tables are changing while the backup is happening, you might get inconsistent data. If you do it as a single transaction, it actually grabs a snapshot of the current state of the database and backs it up. That way you don't get inconsistent data. Lock all tables means when the backup starts, it basically puts the database in read-only mode. So nobody can write to the database so it stays consistent. Um, and then flush logs means you can do, before it does the backup, it takes the binary log and flushes any commands that haven't been executed yet and then does the backup. So it makes sure that the backup is as up-to-date as it can be. All right. I'm going to show you guys the demo after I'm done this part here, the restore. Okay. So a restore is the opposite of a backup. You take the backup and you're using it to recover whatever it is you're trying to recover. So reasons why you do a restore, um, well, you can all guess. Server shit the bed. Bad actor corrupted your database. You know, asteroid flattened your building, whatever. Uh, maybe you just wanted to create another copy of the database for development purposes. So you want to grab a backup of production to put it on test because suddenly you discovered that something's going wrong on the production server, but you obviously don't want to experiment there. So you put it on a dev or a test server, but you want the most recent copy you have. Or you want to restore the database to bring it back to a previous state. Uh, see previous story about Dan truncating the wrong table. Um, so how do you restore a backup in MySQL? So use the MySQL command at the command prompt and you feed it a file. On Windows, it's a little more challenging because the less than symbol has meaning if you're using PowerShell. If you're using normal command prompt, it works just fine. If you use PowerShell, it actually has a different meaning. So if you're going to do backups on Windows, don't use PowerShell, use the command prompt, which is what I'm going to use when I do my demo. Um, and if you have incremental backups, as in you're using the MySQL bin log, you run it as MySQL bin log with whatever the file is called, and you literally pipe it into MySQL. So you're going to rerun all the commands and you're just going to pipe it right into uh, the command line tool. Um, so some links for you guys to enjoy. Uh, the MySQL command, which is the command line command for uh, MySQL. MySQL admin allows you creating and dropping databases. And uh, MySQL dump is to do backups. And now I am going to go and do a demo. And I was stupid because I actually opened up a PowerShell prompt, not a, um, there we go. That's the one I need. Good old command prompt. Good old DOS. Congratulations, Mac users. You don't have this problem. You just got to find where your commands are hidden. Okay. Windows users, it'll be somewhere in here. Not in 8.0. It'll probably be 8.3 or 8.4 for you guys. That's just how long I've had MySQL installed on this machine. It's the same commands. Don't worry about it. The path is different. You'll have to find it for yourself. But it probably under program files. Okay. All right. So in here, you see all the happy little commands that we have. Um, Last week, you saw me play with the MySQL command, right? Do I remember my password? So you guys have seen this command. It's nothing new. I did it last week. Now, I want to do a backup of a database. 
Can I make this bigger? Yes, a little bit bigger there. Okay, not MySQL D, MySQL dump. So if you just type in MySQL dump and you hit enter, you get, how do you use me? Um, I can go, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. I'm going to try to remember my password. It's different from you guys because I set this up a long time ago. And I'm going to back up my credit union database. See, so yeah, that's what I should have checked before I did this class. No, I didn't do this, did I? Oh, you know what? I bet you I could the uh, teller one. Nope, because I don't have permissions to do the backup. Oh, what's my password? Uh, I knew it last semester. Oh, that's the best part. The heck did I set my password to? All right, you know what we're going to do? I'm just going to give myself a user that's full of privileges on that database. So that's why it was really important that you guys remember your password, no CSD 250, potentially with an exclamation mark, because you won't, you won't have this problem. Snow. Great user. Oh, it's with password. Let's see, this shows how often I actually do this. Oh, okay. Yeah, like that, right? No, of course not. That is no pad. No word password. Yeah, I know. This is really good. Good image for the teacher. Okay, good. I created a user. Oh, grant all to grant all privileges all right no, that should be just grant all privileges. On okay, let's try doing that backup one more time. But this time, we're going to use the uh, there we go. The backup worked, it was very quick. As you can see, there's the contents of my database, super useful. Uh, but you know what doesn't have, what, what does not exist? An actual backup file. Because what does it do? 
it literally just dumps it to the output. So what? how do you want to do your backup? You redirect your output to some file somewhere. Um, and I'm going to back it up to, hang on, I think I got a temp directory here. I do. Fantastic. Uh, actually, am I going to go? So it'll take the backs. And this will be uh, cu dot backup. Oh, actually, no, that is SQL. Okay, blink. Looks like nothing ever happened, right? But if we go look at that folder. There's my backup file. There's my uh, my backup for my database. And as you can see, it's plain text, which is why with MySQL backups or any database server backup, they're usually plain text somewhere involved in there. Previous statement about security. Make sure that people can't get a copy of your backup because they have an easy way of restoring your database. Um, so now, if I were to, I want to create a new database. So I'll go my SQL admin uh, create. Actually, I got to feed it the parameter. Actually, I'm not sure if this one will be allowed to do that, but we're going to find out in a second. Uh, create uh, CU backup. Looks like nothing happened, right? So you guys have started playing with your Linux environment, right? In your networking class. What's the funny thing about most Linux commands? No output means it worked, right? So if I were to go into data grip and I look at my properties, and look at my schemas, and I tell it to refresh, here's my newly created database. It did create it, it's just silent. So now I've got a backup, backup files on the disk, and I want to restore my backup into the new database. Okay, so if I type just this in, it just okay. Apparently, I don't know how to type a three-letter password. Um, no backup, right? I just connected to the database. Nothing has happened. So, how do you do the restore? You read it from the file and you go, boom. And you type in your password and then it just blinks. And now the question is, did that work? The answer is yes. Now, this database is 20K or 50K. Real databases will take a little longer than this. And by the way, I pretty much did the entire lab for you guys. So for those of you that were here, great. You'll know what part of the recording to watch to basically get through the entire lab. Mac users, where is your file? Slash USRK. Mac users, your path is this. And I don't know if it's slash bin or not, but that's basically where the odds are your your install is at. Uh, how do I know? I've had to help some people launch MySQL from there. Um, it's user local MySQL, I think. It's somewhere in there. Anyways, um, Linux users, you probably just need to type in MySQL anywhere because it's going to be in the path. But nobody in here is using Linux as their primary operating system, I think. Um, yeah.
that's backups, backups and restores. There's not much more to it than that. There's a lot of general concepts, three freaking commands to actually learn. Uh, any questions? Cold backups is a backup to a file. It's a backup that you have to restore into another server or into the same server or whatever. A hot backup is you can literally turn off one server and either change the DNS or whatever, the host name, whatever it takes, and it point it to another server and it's live all the time. So if, anytime you make a change to server A, server B gets a copy right away instantly. So the two servers are always in sync with each other. So if one blows up, you can just route all the traffic to the second one and it's like they never, nothing ever went wrong. It's a hot backup because it's live and available immediately. So it's hot. If you have to type in commands to restore it, other than, you know, networking type things, then it's a cold backup. Like what I did right now, that's a cold backup because it's going to a file. If it's a hot backup, it's literally going to another production server. So what happens is if you have the binary log turned on and you're working with a hot server environment, both servers are gonna have binary logs. So the command goes to the first server, it creates its binary log, the replication server sends it to the next server, it creates its binary log, and they keep each other in sync that way, but they'll both have the exact same contents in their binary logs, more or less. Well, when it's a hot backup, when it's a hot server, it's only the one server that answers you. Right? So it's only the one server that ever answers you. So for the transaction itself, it only happens on the on whatever server you're connected to. The back of the hot backup server, it's running in a transaction, but it it does it at its own pace. Um, so I'll use OneDrive as an example. Okay. So you know when you create a new file on your disk and you drop it in your OneDrive or Dropbox or whatever software you use to back up your files. When you create that file, OneDrive makes a copy and sends it to Microsoft's OneDrive cloud service, right? You make a change to that file. You'll, if you watch it, you'll see the little cloud icon showing that it's syncing, right? All the time. So you're only interacting with this file, but your copy is going elsewhere. That the hot backup does the same thing. So imagine that you have two computers side by side. You're logged into both machines. OneDrive is on both machines. You make a change in one. It goes to whatever, Microsoft, and it comes back down. So for example, in this machine here, if I go into my OneDrive, so, you know, my personal OneDrive right here, and I go into the, my summer course here, and I'm gonna take this file and copy it. Okay, you can see that there's a little icon that it's showing that it's synced and now it's sent, right? Right now, my computer at home is grabbing a backup of this file from OneDrive. So my computer at home is my hot backup of this, but it's using OneDrive to do the sync. But which file am I interacting with? This one. It's the same thing with hot backup. Whatever your interaction you're doing with a server, it's only with whatever server you're connected to. Does that answer your question, kind of? More or less, sort of? Okay. That's the best example I can give of a hot backup. Like literally with MySQL in a cluster environment, this makes me sick thinking about it, but MySQL in a cluster environment, Postgres in a cluster environment, Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server in a cluster environment, literally, it's almost exactly how this works. The changes happen on the database, it gets copied through some service, replication service, to another server. Usually there's some kind of orchestration service that's running in the middle, making sure that the replication goes to all to the appropriate machines as needed. Sometimes the replication service is running on the primary node and it just worries about sending things off. Sometimes it's actually running on a separate node and it orchestrates making sure everybody's kept up to date. It depends on how the architecture is set up, different 
companies do things differently, but the concept's the same. Changes happen in database A, something notices it, grabs the changes, copies it to database B via whatever in-between method it uses. Any other questions? Going once, twice, tres. No, okay, we're done. <laughs>